Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I just wanted to thank everyone who has spread the good news of Potterless to their friends, their families, their loved ones, etc. via word of mouth. I've seen more and more messages on Twitter or Facebook or the Gmail or in iTunes reviews about people saying that they told their friend about Potterless and they love it now. They told their brother about Potterless and they love it now. Or they, or they told their mom about it and they love it now. And I think that's incredible because look, let's be honest, everyone and their mom has a podcast. There's a jillion and a half podcasts out there. They're all amazing. But when you go to someone that you know specifically will like this podcast and you're like, hey, Theodore, I know you're going to love this podcast that's very silly and ridiculous about Harry Potter, but here's why. I think that's great, and I really appreciate that so much. So thank you guys so much. That's just, ah, it's fantastic. And of course, thanks to our newest patrons on Patreon, Harlan Haskins, Jessica Allen, and that's Jessica with two C's, so you know she means business, Kala Estes, or Eights. I had a friend who spelled it E-S-T-E-S and pronounced it Eights. I don't know what it is correct. I'm so sorry. And a patron pledge that was devoted to a birthday wish for Chris Schroeder. Chris... Happy birthday! And as always, thanks to our producer-level patrons, Leanne Davis, Griffin Meckelberg, Vicky Garcia, Andreas Ozelby, and Aaron Johnson, who always peel their oranges in one continuous pull. But let's continue our journey through Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire as we discuss chapters 14 through 16 with Jay Kilroy. Now, there's a few things I bring up in chapter 14 that at the time of recording this, I was like, these are weird, but now that I finished the book and got to the plot twist, have so much more meaning. So if you don't want spoilers, for some reason, skip ahead like a minute or so. But Neville timidly saying Cruciatus Curse during the class when they're asking about the unforgivable curses has so much more meaning because of what happened to his parents. And Moody, who's not really moody, asking Neville for tea so that he can give him the book and all this stuff. Oh, there's so much more meaning. And now I get it. And it was great because I read that chapter like while I was editing this podcast episode. So while I'm editing it and reading it, I, I'm like, oh, oh so it's <laughs> it's great. And this episode is going to be great. So without further ado, let's get into the episode with Jay Kilroy. <laughs> Internet, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 24-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert, and I am joined by the beautiful, used to write for Playboy man himself, Jake Kilroy. How's it going, bud? Doing, doing pretty well. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited. Dude, no problem. I'm very excited to continue our little section of this like middle-ish chunk of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. We are getting ready to start meeting the people from the other schools, which is exciting. A lot of exciting things happening. Good stuff going down. So I say we just get right into it. Let's, let's get it cracking. Let's talk about some magic. Chapter 14, which is called The Unforgivable Curses. So clearly they're going to learn about Avada Kedavra, which is great. Uh, mm-hmm. Neville, you learn that Neville apparently has melted six cauldrons so far in his Hogwarts careers, uh, which makes me really question how there is a fan theory that I know nothing about and I want to get surprised by, but apparently there's some fan theory where Neville turns out to be the, the chosen one, not Harry. Uh, and I don't mm-hmm. know how this works, but I don't know how someone is bumbling of a fool as Neville is somehow like rumored that he was maybe be going to be the savior, but then wasn't written that way. He's like a savant. Maybe, yeah, maybe he is. Or he just uses gillyweeds to save humanity. So Neville gets detention from Snape for melting a cauldron, but can you give someone a detention for just being bad at school? I feel like detentions are supposed to be behavioral, not like if you're stupid. It seems wildly unfair to give him detention for just being bad at potions. It's a good point. Yeah, but the, the students think that Snape is just upset because he didn't get chosen for the Defense Against the Dark Arts job again. There's that. But then there's also a thought that Snape and Moody have some sort of history. So I'm sure that'll be delved into later. They get to Moody's class. He states that they have done a good job learning about creatures, thanks to Lupin, but they haven't learned about any curses, so they're behind. He says he's only going to do this job for one year as a favor for Dumbledore, which is convenient mm-hmm. since Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers, by contract, are not allowed to last more than a year. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and he mentions that they're not supposed to learn these curses from dark arts, just the counters, and they learn the actual curses in year six, not to do them, but at least what they are. But Moody and Dumbledore have decided that they should teach them earlier. They're just like, you know, they got to learn early. Moody catches Lavender Brown bragging about her horoscope to Pavarti. So you learn that his special eye can see like behind his head or when he's not looking, which is fantastic. Yeah. So then he's like going around asking if any of the students know the forbidden curses or what are they called? They're the the unforgivable curses. So Ron Mm -hmm. raises his hand about Imperius. Moody takes out a jar of spiders. He does Imperio to a spider, and I took Latin in high school, so now I know what everything means. Imperio, uh, Imperio is Latin for I order. He does the curse, and then the spider starts doing circus tricks and, like, walks on a trapeze of, of silk and then, like, does flips and tumbles and all that kind of stuff like that. You learn that this curse gives a wizard complete control over another wizard, so the Latin translation makes sense. Um, yeah, so then, did not know that. Yeah, fun facts with a nerd like me. So Neville then raises <laughs> his hand, and it's hinted by the narrator that the only class he's good at is herbology, so it's shocking that he would raise his hand in another class. And he says cruciatus, which is Latin for torture. So Moody uses crucio, which puts the spider into like these crazy spasms, and all the kids like freak out. And then for the final curse, Hermione raises her hand and then very sheepishly says Avada Kedavra, which is the killing curse, which is Latin for I destroy as I speak. I had to actually look up the translation of this one, but that's a super daunting translation. It sounds like a metal, like a metal band. I destroy as I speak. Yeah, that'd be a really good title of a Metallica album. So there's no blocking Avada Kedavra. There's no counter curse. And Harry Potter is the only person to have ever survived it. So Harry gets embarrassed. But then also starts just, like, thinking about his parents' death because now he knows the death. But in addition to learning this, we get, a th- like, a three-paragraph recap of book three and Dementors and the death and all this other stuff because we haven't had enough recaps in this book yet. <sighs> Apparently, Avada Kedavra requires a lot of power in order for you to do it. And then Moody keeps saying his catchphrase of constant vigilance and just yells it over and over again at the students. <laughs> So you get a life sentence if you use any of these three unforgivable curses, which is intense. Yeah. (laughs) Neville is really spooked by the lesson. So Moody is like, hey, come come grab tea with me after class. Uh, And the squad is confused, like, what's this all about? Hermione then plows through (laughs) dinner again to go to the library. Um, Ron and Harry go back to the tower, and they see Neville with a book about magical water plants that he got from Moody. Apparently, Sprout told Moody that Neville was really good at herbology, so Moody gave him this book. To which Harry is like, oh, that's good, because no one ever says anything nice to Neville, which is, like, super douchey of Harry to say, or to think internally. Poor Neville, dude. Dude. He tries so hard. He really... I feel bad for the kid, but he gets hot by the end, so it's cool. Yeah, he turns out to be like young Clive Owen. It's just like, at this stage, it's just like, oh, he's got so much love to give. (laughs) So Ron and Harry are struggling with their divination homework, and this becomes my favorite part in the whole book. Ron says, let's go with the old divination standby, and Harry's like, what's that? He goes, make it up. Quote, you know her, just throw in a bunch of misery and she'll believe it. So (laughs) Ron cements himself as the coolest person in the world. So so they just decide they're just gonna... You know, dude, he's he's going down a bad path in this book. I mean, he is Fred and George's brother. Speaking of Fred and George, they're working on some parchment very secretively, which is interesting. So you overhear them them say, quote, no, that sounds like we're accusing him. We have to be careful. But, you know, you don't know what this is about because they're just Harry just eavesdropping. Hermione then comes back from the library, asks them about homework, and Ron shows them their made-up predictions And Hermione's like, you said that you're going to drown twice next week. And he's like, ah, I'll change it to being trampled to death by a hippogriff, which doesn't change the fact that he's still dying twice in one week. (laughs) <laughs> that Ron, he's, he's, he's quick sometimes, sometimes uh, not so much. <laughs> exactly. You finally learn what she's been running off to the library to do, and it's super lame. Uh, she's been working on making a new club, SPEW, which is the Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare. So she's... Oh, this- it's super lame to care about other, other creatures, Mike? Uh, it's super lame when it seems like that is their purpose on life, and that is literally what every single person tells her when she tells them about the club. Everyone's like, yo, house elves like helping people it's what they do but then there's some like dobby and also i mean you could i mean how many slave owners would be like oh no they love working i feed them that's true i mean i do think slave labor is terrible i just was really annoyed by dobby 
So I have no sympathy for house elves. He was so oh, annoying. Oh, God, I love Dobby. I know, everyone does, but he was such a piece of shit in the second book. I don't know, he must have a huge, he must have a huge oh, turnaround. Outrageous <laughs> piece of shit. Not Dobby, sir. Uh, Dobby is a good house elf. Oh, God. Yeah, he talks in third person, which is the sign of a great character. He's the only one I ever forgive for talking in third person, because I... I think he's so cute. Well, good for him. So she says that she was originally going to call the club, quote, stop the outrageous abuse of our fellow magical creatures and campaign for a change in their legal situation, which just didn't flow off the tongue like spew. I guess Stauphomkakafokaitifels was not... Did you spell that out? (laughs) Yeah, I wrote it down. (laughs) That's amazing. Also, that whole club name sounds like it would be like a really good band name for like a really pretentious indie. <laughs> uh, so Hedwig finally returns with a letter from Sirius and the basic summary of Sirius's letter is like, Oh shit, I'm on my way. <laughs> and Harry then gets really concerned because he's like, Oh no, like I didn't want to make Sirius come back and maybe get caught. But Sirius is like, yeah, your scar hurting plus a bunch of rumors that I've heard plus Moody getting a job all points to bad signs, meaning that Dumbledore is reading the signs. And now Harry's like really upset and he's worried that he's got to get it in prison. He's, you know, really, like, angry and angsty and, like, goes to bed angry. And that's the end of the chapter. Dude, it's hard to be 14. It really is. So chapter 15, Bo Baton and Durmstrang. Harry Potter writes a dumb note to Sirius that is like, just kidding, my scar didn't hurt. I probably just dreamed that. He goes to Hedwig, but Hedwig is being really sassy because last night Harry didn't feed Hedwig for flying back, even though there's an owlry with owl food up there. So Hedwig won't deliver a letter, so he's got to use pigwidgeon, which is fine. So he does that, goes to classes, and apparently classes across the board are just getting really hard. Moody in his class, puts the Imperious Curse on people so that they know what it feels like. And one by one, everyone is just, like, completely wrecked by it. Except for Harry Potter. Of course. He's so strong. He's so strong. So Harry, like, hears voices. He hears Moody's voice trying to tell him to do stuff. But then he hears this other voice that just, like, questions them. Like, Moody's like, jump on the desk. And then this other voice is like, I don't think I want to. And it's like, why would I do that? It's like, jump on the desk. Jump on the desk. And this other voice is like, nah, I don't think we should. So then Harry gets, like, caught in between jumping and not jumping. And he does, like, a half jump and, like, rams his knees into the desk and breaks both of his kneecaps. Just obliterates his kneecaps, apparently, which seems really intense for, like, just hitting your knee on a desk to, like, break both of them. He doesn't actually break him, right? He just, like, he feels like he did. Okay, maybe it feels like he did, because you're right. He doesn't go to Pomfrey after, so he must not have actually broke them, but still, a little Or if he, dude, maybe he did, and just like, fuck it, I'll just rub some dirt on it. I'm Harry Potter. Get fucked. Get stuffed, <laughs> Get I mean. stuffed. <laughs> Uh, so Moody's, like, really proud that he's like, oh, look, Harry started to resist it. That's really cool. Um, so then, let's see, uh, you find out that Harry and Ron get top marks in Trelawney's class for their bullshit homework, which is amazing, and she's so proud of them that she asks them to do it for the next month as well, and Ron is like, crap, I exhausted myself thinking of ways to die, I gotta write some other stuff. And one thing I don't quite get is that if she believes that they're doing this accurately, does she just think that they're wrong, or does she believe that they're gonna die in the next week. Like, I don't quite get, like, why she's not calling that, like, either recognizing that as bullshit or, like, concerned because if they're doing it correctly, then they are foreseeing their actual death, like, in the next several days. I just think she doesn't care. She just really loves misery. She's a bad teacher, dude. Horrible teacher. Horrible professor. I don't know how she got a job and has tenure. She's horrible. I guess she's not, like, turning anyone into a ferret and beating them, so I guess that <laughs> must be it. She's not abusing students. The students then see a note in the Great Hall about the Triwizard Tournament. It says that the people from the other schools are going to come on October 30th, and then on October 31st, they're going to announce who gets picked for the tournament. Cedric is rumored to be entering. Ron is like, ah, not him. He's such a pretty boy. Hermione defends Cedric. And then Ron is like, you only like him because he's hot. She's like, I don't do that. And then he does a fake cough to say Lockhart, like the Lockhart, which is great. Like Ron is just doing all the good cough moves. The classic go-to. So solid. So the cleaning of Hogwarts is really intense in preparation for the guests. Decorations are on fleek. McGonagall tells Neville to not tell people how bad he is at magic. Like a professor tells a student don't let people know how shit you are. Like, what the heck is going on? Yeah, dude, they're 
they, they're really straight up with everyone. So brutal to Neville. Fred and George say something suspect about giving someone a letter, but then again, it's only overhearing, so you don't know what it's about. And then they start talking with the squad about the tournament. Hermione starts talking about history, and then they start making fun of her for being a nerd. She's like, guys, it's all in Hogwarts a history. But then she goes on this thing where she says, which actually should be renamed a highly biased and selective history of Hogwarts, which glosses over the nastier aspects of the school, which is like a great social commentary on textbooks. So good. In every history book, like, America's amazing and was never at fault for anything. No, the Native Americans just, g- just like, gave us the land yeah. as, like, a birthday present. And the Vietnam War just yeah, no. didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. That, no, that's the thing is, like, dude, I, Hermione's got so many good ideas, and, I, yeah, she's, she's a truth sir. She really is. Hermione then is being really annoying trying to get people to join Spew. The twins try to convince her that the house elves are happy doing this. They're like, we've snuck into the kitchen before. They seem really happy. Sirius then uh, has another note come in, and he's like, yo, nice try, Harry. Don't worry, I'm super hidden. Good job to keep switching owls. You should keep doing that. And Hedwig's sassiness turned out to be a blessing in disguise. But he's basically saying, like, I'm going to help you out. Don't worry. I'm going to be fine. So the people from the other schools are coming. The Bobatons come in on a giant flying horse-drawn carriage by flying horses, and a very large woman steps out. Clearly, she will become a love interest for Hagrid, which happens in the next chapter. And it's a dozen boys and girls wearing silk. They're not not dressed cold enough. They're all, like, shivering, and they seem to, like, not enjoy being there. Hagrid says he has to tend to his, quote, other charges, so there's something going on with the Scroots. Apparently, they're going to become a major plot point some point at some instance in this novel. The Durmstrang people then arrive on a pirate ship that comes through a whirlpool in the Hogwarts lake, which is really cool, but also what happened to the giant squid? You just let him pass. Like, yeah, I feel like the giant squid should like murder this boat, but I don't know. Maybe it's okay. I do wonder how much control they have over the giant squid. Because they have no control over the freaking Whomping Willow. Oh. The Whomping yeah, Willow no, that, murders that's everything. Fucking, yeah, that thing's rogue as fuck. <laughs> so the giant woman's name is Madame Maxime. The head of Durmstrang comes out. He has silver hair and a fancy silver jacket, and his name is Professor Krakarov, which is a beautifully Russian, Eastern Europe, whatever name. They say his mm. voice is, quote, fruity and unctuous, which is basically being, like, suave and, like, maybe evil. And then they see Victor Crumb, which is supposed to be a big plot twist, but I already knew this because I saw the fourth movie. So they see Crumb, and Ron is like, Oh, my God, it's Victor Crumb! I really hope that there's a point where Ron shows Victor Crumb his Victor Crumb action figure, because I think that would just make for a really funny conversation. Wait till you get to the, the several-page sex scene between Crumb and Ron. It's, oh. it's aggressive at best. <laughs> I'm so excited. And then chapter 16, The Goblet of Fire, the final chapter we will be covering in this episode. So the Bobaton students are, like, really snootily meh about Hogwarts when they get inside. They, like, think it's ugly and are still shivering because they didn't prepare to be in Scotland. It's in Scotland, right? Hogwarts? Yeah. Is it, or is it in England? Where is it? I thought... I thought it was in the English countryside, but now I'm doubting what I know. Scotland is technically in England, right? Wait, no, because they take a train there. Yeah. So if they're leaving from London, yeah, imagine London. I don't know, it's in the UK. They're clearly not prepared for the weather of the UK, but they mm. should have known that. But they're French, so they're stubborn. <laughs> um, that bring you back? Oh, dude, does bring me back. Remember that time we went to France? And we went to the <laughs> raclette party, which is literally a party where it's like fondue, except you melt cheese in individual spatulas and then pour it on top of meat or bread or potatoes. And it's the greatest thing in the world. Dude, it's, it was one of the best nights of my life. <laughs> I ate, I think I did the math of how much cheese I ate. And I think I ate like two and a half pounds of cheese that night. Oh, Jesus. I'm like almost afraid to do the math because I'm scared of how disgusted I'll be at myself. <laughs> it was wrong. I was like, I mean, I was happy as hell, oh, but I feel so like I, I tried to like, explain how much cheese I ate to someone. Someone would like sit me down and just be like, that's fucking reckless. You lunatic. That's that's too much cheese. It was so good. <laughs> it was absolutely incredible. I was so glad when you came and you were like a vegetarian. You said you're a vegetarian. I was like, oh, please don't be vegan because you will <laughs> die in France. There's cheese everywhere. <laughs> Dude, yeah, that was like pretty much my diet when I was there was just cheese and bread, yeah. which it was a good life. It's a great life. Cheese, bread, and wine. What's not to love? 
<sighs> so let's see. Um, the food comes out, and they have food from all over the world, apparently. There is some French food, and Hermione says that the stew that is there is called bou- bouillabasse, or whatever. Bouillabasse, or something. <laughs> Ron says, bless you, which is the great, another great <laughs> classic joke. Absolutely. He's fucking wrong, on point. Killing it. A Bobaton girl walks up to Ron and asks if they're done with the stew and if she can have some. Ron gets, like, instantly swooned, and then as she walks away, he's like, oh, that girl's got to be a Vila. Hermione's like, that's not a Vila. Ron is like, yo, they don't make them, they don't make them like they do at Hogwarts. <laughs> which is another Fucking classic Vila. Ron, dude. <laughs> and Harry's like, hey, they make them all right, which he said because Cho was like three seats away from him. So springing to the defense of his love interest. Also at the same time, the Vilas? Wait, what are they called again? The Vilas. Vilas. I think are like some of the fascinating, like anytime there's a sort of like siren character, I'm like immediately intrigued. And I love how doofusy all the dudes act at the Quidditch World Cup. And then as soon as he sees her, it's just like, love it. Mm -hmm. So yes, exactly. Boys all turn their head as she passes. So you realize that she's basically part Vila in some way, Mm -hmm. even though she looks like a normal person, basically. So Crouch and Bagman are there because they helped organize the event. And you learn a little bit more about the event itself. So you learn that there are three challenges which will test magical powers, the daring, the power of deduction, and the ability to cope with danger of the students. Dumbledore then unveils the Goblet of Fire from a casket, which is the thing that will choose the champions from each school. And he says that they have 24 hours to enter. It's going to be in a room. There's going to be a line drawn, a big circle around it. That is an age line, which prevents people that are under the age of 17 from going near it. And Dumbledore mentions that you can't change your mind or back out of it if you're selected. Like, if you enter, it's a binding contract. You have to represent your school. It means you were chosen for a reason. You can't shy away. You're committing. Did they talk about the consequences? Like... He didn't, I didn't think he did. He, didn't say, was he doesn't say what the consequences are, but he basically just says, like, if you get chosen, you have to do it. That's all he yeah. really says. Krakoroff then shows special treatment to Crumb by when they're leaving the dinner. It's like, hey, Crumb, like, did you have enough food? Do you want some more wine? Which is, like, really weird. I don't understand, like, where this is going, but I don't like it at all. So, <laughs> he tells the other student to, like, basically, like, shut up. Yeah, another student's like, I'd like more wine. And he says, I wasn't talking to you, Prokhorov. Yeah, he, you have food all whatever. over you. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you got food all over your bib. Like, that's your fault if you're still hungry. I don't know. It's <laughs> super weird. Really don't get it. So there, the Durmstrang people are walking away. And then they see Harry. And they all, like, stop in place and get amazed. And then you hear a voice from the back go, yeah, that's Harry Potter. And it's Moody. So he comes to, like, diffuse the situation. And you get the vibe that... That he and Krakarov have some sort of history, but you don't know what it is. So Moody just has beef with everyone. <laughs> like Dude. he's got beef with Lucius Malfoy, he's got beef with Snape, he's got beef with Krakarov. Like everybody doesn't like this dude. <laughs> but does he's like if he spent his whole life and his whole career and his whole reputation is based off of like catching that many evildoers? Every time someone has a beef with Moody, like it's supposed to be like, you know, there's like a side to eat story. I mean, Moody is like, that dude's not okay. That <laughs> dude's fucking evil. <laughs> exactly. So it's the next day. And rather than sleep in late, which the book describes as, quote, most students would have breakfasted late on a Saturday. Like breakfasted is I didn't know you could verb things. I guess you can like say we lunched. But I thought it just sounded strange to be like rather than say they slept in. It's they breakfasted late. <laughs> yeah. So Fred George and Lee Jordan said that they took an aging potion to age them a few months so that they could cross the line. So Fred and George go across the line, but they get like violently thrown out and then beards grow on them. Super aged then. Yeah. So I don't know if they didn't describe it well enough to know if like A, it was their potion that fucked up. B, if that's the punishment for going in the circle. And C, if they like aged at all or if they just get old man beards. Like, I don't know if they actually become old or they just look like ZZ Top. <laughs> yeah, I took it as the, uh, their normal age, but just randomly old man's beard. And then you spot like, oh, you broke the rules, assholes. Yeah, so Dumbledore basically comes into the room and basically says, you broke the rules, assholes, uh, and sends them off to Madame Pomfrey. But he does compliment them, saying that other people tried to do it, but, quote, your beards looked the best. <laughs> Angelina Johnson, who you learn is black, which I, is great. It's the first time the book has admitted that anyone isn't white, which is cool. I guess they never said that Harry is white or that Hermione and Ron are. I mean, you get that Ron is because he's a ginger. But this is the first time where they're explicitly like, yo, not white person, which is fantastic. Yeah, because like I, I mean, Cho Chang, you have the assumption, but like I don't know if it, 
if her ethnicity is ever like addressed. No, nah, you're just assuming she's Asian. Right. But this is – they just go out there like, yo, Angelina Johnson, black by the way, which is cool because uh, if you've ever seen any of the movies, not a lot of non-white people at Hogwarts – uh, yeah. Not a lot of diversity. Have you ever seen the YouTube video where it's like every line by every person of color in the Harry Potter series? No. Okay, so it's a YouTube video that is a compilation of every single line that is said by someone that is not white in the Harry Potter movies. Over the span of eight movies, eight feature length films, the total YouTube video is like seven and a half minutes. Whoa. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Come on, Hogwarts. Or just come on, people making the movies. There was a play version of it where they cast a black girl for Hermione and people were super pissed. It's like, yo, they never said that Hermione is not black. They never said that Hermione is white. They just said she has bushy hair. Guess what? You can be any race and have bushy hair. So people are like, oh, Hermione's not supposed to be black. It's like, she's not supposed to be anything. I totally agree. I I didn't understand it all because it's not like her race was like an identifying trait of her character at all. No, not at all. She's just a know-it-all nerd. Doesn't matter what she looks like. So never yeah. understood the outrage on that. But uh, also, wait, that actually, did I also learned that uh, like there was a huge thing about Lavender Brown because it, she's black in one of the first movies, and then when the role got bigger, when she takes a bigger role in one of the later movies, she was replaced with a white actress. Wait, really? Yeah, I think it was Lavender Brown. I'll have to find that. Whoa. But it was just like, oh, you, this, you guys. <sighs> she t- oh, I'm really sad that Lavender Brown takes a larger role because she's super annoying. I don't like her. <laughs> anyway, let's see. Uh, Angelina Johnson puts her name in the goblet. And basically, Ron and Hermione are all hoping it's her because Ron doesn't like Cedric Diggory. And Hermione just wants it to be a Gryffindor. All of the Beaubaton people that came put their names in. All the Durmstrang people that came put their names in. Which makes sense because if they came all the way to Hogwarts and then didn't put their names in the goblet, that'd be super weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Harry, Ron, and Hermione decide that they're going to go visit Hagrid because they haven't done that in a while. And when they go there, he's like all dressed up, obviously to impress Madame, what's her name? Maxime. Yeah. So obviously to impress Madame, uh, Madame Maxime, but... They, you know, you find that out later, but it's painfully obvious. Hagrid mentions that the Scroots are three feet long, and they've also been killing each other, so the Scroots are problematic. Not cool. Hermione then tells him about Spew, and even Hagrid's like, yo, house elves love working. I don't know why you're trying to do this. Hagrid also puts on cologne, so he's really just pulling out all the stops. And then he- I imagine him dressing, like, for, like, a bad prom, yes. like, in like, the early 80s. Yep, pretty much. The squad was supposed to walk back with Hagrid to the Great Hall, but when Hagrid goes outside, he sees Madame Maxime and the Beaubaton people walk out of their little carriage, so he just gets swooned and swept up and walks back with her instead. So that's how they find out the love interest and the kids just walk back on their own. So they get to the Great Hall, and the goblet is ready. All of the lights in the Great Hall are, like, turned off, except for jack-o'-lanterns and the Goblet of Fire, which is, like, Pretty sweet. Sweet answer. Mm -hmm. The goblet starts choosing the names and it basically just like spits out the piece of paper that is chosen and like slightly chars it. So the goblet spits out a piece of paper and you learn that crumb is chosen, obviously. Krokoroff gets really excited and a little too much. He's like, oh, I'm so proud of you, Crumb. I know you could do it. Like, really weird pseudo dad living vicariously through an 18-year-old kid. Like, pretty creepy. I don't understand this whole dynamic, but I don't like it at all. I really, <laughs> really uncomfortable. Uh, then Flo Delacour is chosen from Bobaton. She is the Vila girl that, you know, asked Ron for the stew. And all of the other Bobatons are super pissed, which is very French of them. <laughs> Um, Two of them are sobbing. A bunch of them are like really disgruntled. Classic Frenchies. <laughs> and, then, and then the third name comes out and it's Cedric Diggory, much to the dismay of Ron. So Cedric is the Hogwarts representative. Then Dumbledore starts describing a little bit more. He's like, all right, now that they've been chosen, blah, 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 blah. And then he's interrupted mid word because the goblet spits out another piece of paper and Dumbledore just, like, grabs it without looking at it, puts the piece of paper in front of his eyes, stares at it in disbelief, and then just says, Harry Potter. Holy shit, dude! Uh, Inception noise, like, like, (laughs) and that is the end of chapter 16, and the end of what what we will be covering on this episode of Potterless. Jake, how do you feel? (laughs) 
Dude, fucking so hyped for what's to come because like, did, how did how does his name get in there? How did that happen? What like what are there going to be the events in the Tribal Wizard tournament? I mean, I know, but I'm like crazy excited for you to find out. Yeah, dude, I have no idea. All I know going forward is that there's a dragon thing. Uh, uh-huh. There's a there's a, a water thing with mermaids and gillyweed, and then there's a uh, there's a, a maze where Cedric gets murdered, like just porky oh. to death. So I know that that happens. The, the, I will say the fourth movie is the stuff that I remember the most because I was the oldest when I was watching the movies and it was a really good movie. But as I've learned now that I've been watching the movies after I finished the books, the movies leave out a ton of stuff. So even if I remembered the movie 100%, which I don't, I feel like I still would be missing out on a ton of things because they just gloss over so many things. Ooh. I feel like the third movie was pretty... Not that it was poorly done, but so many things were just, like, glossed over. Like, the whole big dramatic thing where you learn, like, 12 plot twists was just, like, mm-hmm. way too quick and fast and not dramatic at all. I don't know. Yeah. I thought... No, that, the one that drives you the crazy the most is the sixth movie. Okay. That one, like... Especially because they actually do something in that movie that changes Harry as a character. Huh? Like, just a, a decision, and I don't understand why they did it, and it doesn't make any sense to me. Interesting. I'm not surprised, because everyone has said that their favorite books are the third and the sixth. So I can f- understand why everyone's passionate about that. And the sixth book is like really long. I know that a lot of people have said that they were surprised that the seventh book was broken into two movies, but not the sixth. Because really the seventh didn't have to if you take out all the camping or whatever, which is what everyone hates, <laughs> um, which I know nothing about, except they go camping and everyone's pissed. So I'm surprised that they didn't uh, do that for the sixth. Dude, and also the sixth movie focuses more on romance than the darkness that's Ugh. like surrounding the magical world. Lame. Yeah, but the thing about the fourth book is, which is why it's technically my favorite, uh, is that it starts off very bright and kind of like the first three. Uh, well, the third one kind of goes dark, but that the way that the fourth book ends is like when all sh- everything is it, shit is real now. Like yeah. there are serious fucking dangers now. Yes. I'm excited. I know that, like, Cedric dies, and there's the whole, like, Voldemort, Darkmark people are there in full force. So I know that, like, shit gets real. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. I like that things are getting more intense. It's fun. It's definitely better than, you know, the first two books, which are basically just episodes of Scooby-Doo. Like, it's nice that that there is, like, real consequences and stuff happening and people dying. Yeah. Yeah, no, because that's the thing is, like, it starts off with, like, it expands the magical, it expands the wizarding world, getting to see beyond, like, just Hogwarts and the goddamn fucking Dursleys. Ugh, yeah, because we have not, hey, did you know that the Dursleys suck? I don't know if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever known this, but they're really bad people, and they suck. And they're also fat, and Petunia looks like a horse, just in case you didn't know. God, even just talking about them now makes me so fucking mad. Hey, at least we didn't run into any Quidditch this time. There's no Quidditch. It was beautiful. I'm so happy. That's where we part with. I love Quidditch. What? How? You've never played sports. I, <laughs> I, I mean, well, the thing is, like, to me, it's just like, it's just sort of like sky hockey or fucking like air soccer. Uh, but it's not because only one person matters. Uh. But you can still lose even if you uh If, if you're you an idiot, the- if you're a bumbler, like a super idiot and your team is atrocious, you have to be Dude, down by I, 160 I on the- points. I, <laughs> oh. I could have, like, if you don't have, like, a star player, you know, maybe, like, a whole, like, but a good rest of the team to like score through the other methods. I mean like dude, I was on a JV basketball team that went one and twenty one and we lost to a team that only had four players on the court in the end. Oh I, dude. So the idea it's like, you know, there's a lot of ways to win in Quidditch. <laughs> no, there's oh, only no. one. It's catch the snitch and have more points. That's literally the oh. only way to win. But that's means like, okay, catching the snitch scores how many points? hundred and fifty. So I mean like you can <laughs> like it, it takes a lot, but you know <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad we were able at the very end to work in a Quidditch rant because it wouldn't be an episode <laughs> about it. But yes, what you were saying earlier is exactly correct, that this book is fantastic because it takes you out of what we know so far in the Harry Potter world through through, through the Quidditch World Cup yeah. and then the Triwizard Tournament. So you get to, like a larger scope and it's like, oh, wow, like bigger, more amazing. There's a lot more to like kind of understand about this world. And it's exactly. like, oh, yeah. And then like uh, team murder. And it's like, oh, well, that's. <laughs> and like pretty careless too like it's not even like dramatic it's just like Lord Voldemort like just drops his just ass just boom yeah just straight murks him 
even though you know Ron criticized him for it, like Cedric was pretty. <laughs> yeah, he was Robert Pattinson. Like, come on, <laughs> he's yeah. not a bad looking dude. <laughs> And, dude, surprisingly chill in the book. Yeah, and he's the only person that goes to Hufflepuff. He's the only person. <laughs> There's no one else. I know. Dude, uh, what I saw a video today of Eddie Redman. Uh-huh. Eddie Redmayne, I guess. Yeah, the um, guy who's in Fantastic Beasts and where they live and where to, where to, where to look for them, where they exist, where they're located. <laughs> <laughs> Such a long movie title, but uh, he talks like he talks about like I have a confession. I'm a Hufflepuff. No, I'm a proud Hufflepuff. And it's, I don't know, like someone like introducing themselves at like an AA meeting. It's like those poor Hufflepuffs are so nice and so sweet. Yeah, they're great. And they're everyone bros. Them, but... They're so loyal. I don't know why they got so much crap. Like they're Hufflepuffs, yeah. man. What's not to love? They have such big hearts. You know. You know. They do, they really <laughs> they really do. Oh man. Well, speaking of big hearts, I love you, man. And this was great to have you on for the Dude. podcast. Good times. Thank you very much for having me. I think this podcast is a terrific idea, and I'm very excited to uh, to see your thought or to hear your thoughts uh, with like where the story goes in the next few. Uh, I'm excited, man. So yeah, internet. If you enjoyed Jake's presence, you can follow him along. Is it just add Jake Kilroy on everything? I don't know if you have anything yeah. in particular you want. I to sold follow. out. I know. It's just Jake. Miller. Yeah, you used to you used to have a different Twitter handle, but now it's just your name, you freaking nerd. Uh, yeah, that's the funny thing. I changed it because I started thinking that after um, I was on your last podcast. Yeah, on Gone in Six Seconds, I was like, "Why is it fake book covers?" And you were like, "Oh, is this thing I did seven years ago? Oh, maybe yeah. I should change it." <laughs> I spent months and months soul searching after that podcast, dude. <laughs> oh, I feel so terrible, but I guess I'm glad I helped you. You know, discover yeah, your path. Now I'm just- I'm more professional now. So yeah, just Jake Killery. Thanks, man. No worries, dude. Happy to help. But yeah, uh, everyone listening, if you want to continue on this journey from Platform 9 and 3 quarters, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and SoundCloud. If you want to be super awesome, you can rate us, which does a ton of wonderful things. And thanks, just Jake. Thanks for thanks for coming along. This is a good time. Dude, the best. Thank you so much for letting me talk about Harry Potter. Oh, no problem, dude. And uh, until next time, as they say in Hogwarts, wizard on. <laughs> <laughs> Later, dude. Potterless is created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Griffin Meckelberg, Vicky Garcia, Andreas Ozelby, and Aaron Johnson. And the music is by Bettina Campamanes. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can find us on Twitter at PotterlessPod, at Facebook.com slash Potterless, and you can subscribe to us on any of your preferred podcast apps. Also, if you would like to pledge money in order to make the podcast better, you can head on over to Patreon.com slash Potterless. Basically, it's like a running Kickstarter. You pledge money and in exchange for that, you get bonus content. So director's commentary, bonus episodes, the new May bonus episode is going up soon. All kind of fun stuff like that is at our Patreon page. And the funds are used for things like new audio equipment or potentially new merchandise that we're going to start making for Potterless, all kind of stuff like that. So if that interests you, head on over to Patreon. If not, no big deal. Not a problem at all. Just thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, wizard on.